Welcome to this video on toracolumbar spine disorders in adults. In this video we will discuss the common causes of toracolumbar spine pain as well as the diagnostic and treatment options available. For more videos like this feel free to subscribe to the channel. The information presented in the video is intended for medical education and informational purposes only. It is not suitable for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Please consult with your healthcare provider before making any decisions regarding your health and treatment options. The views and opinions expressed in this video are solely those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any healthcare organization or institution. The use of this video for any other purpose is strictly prohibited without the express written consent of the presenter. The spinal column is a crucial part of the skeleton, providing support and protection for the body. Its unique vertical orientation due to the human bipedalism and lack of stabilizing tail makes it susceptible to various pathological conditions. Back problems affecting approximately half of the adult population are a leading cause of absenteeism and high social costs. This video provides an overview of spinal conditions, highlighting the importance of muscles, ligaments and joints in both the development and treatment of these issues. Furthermore, the close connection between skeletal and neurogenic structures necessitate collaboration between specialists in various fields, such as neurologists and neurosurgeons. The next chapter is on low back pain without a specific anatomical substrate. Back pain, particularly lower back pain, is a common issue affecting a significant portion of the population. Low back pain is characterized by discomfort in the transition zone between the lumbar, spine and pelvis. It is estimated that a half of all adults experience back problems regularly. General practitioners and physiotherapists manage a substantial portion of these cases, implying that a sizable number of the back complaints fall outside the purview of orthopedic surgeons. Distinguishing between non-specific lower back pain mechanical and more serious conditions like deformities and other abnormalities can be challenging. This video focuses on the specific low back pain complaints but it first addresses the more prevalent non-specific low back complaints. Primary and secondary tumors, fractures and infections are discussed in separate videos. Non-specific back complaints are di diagnosed through a process of elimination. The Netherlands has developed a chain care guideline for non-specific low back complaints to assist doctors in diagnosing and referring patients. Acute low back complaints. At the initial consultation, a diagnostic triage should be performed, including a thorough medical history and physical examination. If specific conditions like radicular syndrome are suspected based on the medical history, a more comprehensive physical examination should be conducted to rule out or detect these conditions, including neurological ones. Psychosocial factors that can influence the course of back complaints should be considered and analyzed if there is no improvement. Imaging diagnostics such as X-ray, CT scans and MRIs are not routinely recommended for non-specific back complaints. Patients should be re-evaluated within a few weeks of the initial consultation if their condition does not improve sufficiently or if it worsens. For acute low back pain, adequate information and reassurance should be provided to the patient. Patients should be encouraged to maintain an active lifestyle and continue their normal daily activities, including work, as much as possible. Bed rest should be minimized. Pain medications can be prescribed if necessary with paracetamol being the first line choice, followed by NSAIDs. Muscle relaxants are not recommended. Referral for spinal manipulation or exercise therapy may be considered. Approximately 50% of adult population experience chronic and acute low back complaints without signs of radiculopathy each year, and these conditions can be effectively treated with the education and conservative therapy. Bed rest and muscle relaxants are not indicated for acute low back pain. Chronic lower back complaints. Chronic lower back pain lasting over three months often involves non-specific complaints, but it's more accurate to say that these that they lack a clear anatomical cause. While many factors contribute, patients typically experience consistent patterns such as pain during prolonged static loads, worsening with heavy lifting, but improvement with movement. The biopsychosocial model. Orthopedic surgeons face the challenge of accurately differentiating patients with the specific anatomical problems requiring surgical or other invasive interventions from those 
with chronic low back pain without an anatomical substrate. This distinction is crucial for optimizing treatment outcomes and minimizing unnecessary procedures. In summary, chronic low back pain is a complex condition with a multifactorial origin. Effective treatment requires a tailored approach that encompasses exercise therapy, cognitive behavior interventions, and social support, while curative treatments should be reserved for specific anatomical problems. Orthopedic surgeons play a pivotal role in differentiating patients with anatomical anomalies from those with chronic low back pain without an anatomical substrate, ensuring appropriate treatment strategies. The next chapter, Degenerative Disorders of the Spine. Aging of the spine manifests in various degenerative changes, including osseous alterations, facet joint osteoarthritis, intervertebral disc degeneration, and muscle atrophy. These degenerative abnormalities can lead to conditions like hernia nuclei pulposi, spondylosis, spondyloarthrosis, and lumbar spine canal stenosis. Aging of the spine bones can lead to conditions like osteoporosis and osteomalacia. The facet joints which are the synovial joints between the vertebrae, can show signs of osteoarthritis such as chlorosis and hypertrophy. These changes can narrow the spinal canal. The intervertebral disc, which is a gel-like cushion between the vertebrae, is one of the first structures in the spine to show signs of aging. The nucleus propulsus, the gel-like center of the disc, loses elasticity starting around age 20. This leads to a loss of chondroitin sulfate and water in the disc, which reduces the turgor and elasticity. As a result, the disc height decreases and the closing plates of the adjacent vertebrae come closer together. This puts increased pressure on the annulus fibrosis, the ring of fibers that surround the nuclear propulsi. This leads to tears in the annulus fibrosis, which can cause the nuclear propulsis to bulge or prolapse. Disc prolapse, also known as hernia nuclear propulsi, is more common in adults in their 20s and 30s. And research has shown that heavy labor or physical strain does not play a major role in the development of disc degeneration. Instead, genetic and environmental factors are more likely to be the cause. Spondylosis is a condition characterized by reduced intervertebral height, sclerosis of the covering and closing plates, and the presence of syndesmophytes. Syndesmophytes are newly created edge growth of the bone that forms at the attached points of the annulus fibrosis and the longitudinal anterior ligament. These changes are often misinterpreted as wear and tear of the spine, but they are actually a normal part of aging. Spondyl arthrosis is a degenerative condition of the facet joints that are also associated with aging. This condition is characterized by thinning of the cartilage layer, which is similar to the process of osteoarthritis in other joints. While spondylosis and spondyloarthrosis can lead to stiffness and pain, they are not always symptomatic. In fact, many people have these conditions and do not experience any pain at all. Additionally, severity of the radio radiological findings does not always correlate with the severity of symptoms. For example, some people with severe radiological abnormalities may have no pain at all, while others with mild radiological abnormalities will have severe pain. Because spondylosis and spondyloarthrosis are normal aging phenomena, it is important to avoid drawing conclusions on the low bearing capacity of the back or cause of pain complaints based on these findings alone. Other factors such as muscle strength, flexibility and lifestyle also play a role in back pain. Spondylosis discopathy Disc disease is a term used to describe a condition involving an intervertebral disc that can be painful. The process of disc degeneration begins with the loss of height of the intervertebral disc, which lead to a period of instability. Over time, the disc will return to a stable and asymptomatic phase. Patients with disc disease typically present with chronic intermittent low back pain between the ages of 30 and 55. The pain is usually localized in the lumbar lower region and may radiate to the sacroiliac joints and over the back of the thigh up to the knee. Physical examination typically reveals no abnormalities, including no neurological abnormalities. Radiological imaging, including x-rays and MRI, has a low sensitivity and low specificity for diagnosing disc disease. 
Initial treatment of the disc disease is conservative, focused on patient education, exercise and pain medication. The natural history of disc disease is favorable and most patients improve with conservative treatment. If conservative treatment fails, spondylodesis, a surgical procedure that fuses two vertebrae together, may be considered. However, there is no convincing evidence that spondylodesis is more effective than conservative treatment. Also, no relationship has yet been demonstrated between a positive pain provocation during discography and a good result after spondylodesis. Great restraints with regard to this form of surgery is therefore appropriate. The lumbosacral radicular syndrome, hernia nucleopopulsi, palsy, also known as HNP, and sciatica. This herniation, also known as hernia nucleopopulsi, palsy, HNP, is a relatively common condition, about 2 in 1000, where the inner part of the intervertebral disc bulges into the spinal canal. This can cause pain, numbness and weakness in the legs. Acute lumbosacral radicular syndrome is common as a common symptom of HMP. It is characterized by pain radiating into the buttocks and or leg, accompanied by neurological symptoms. The clinical course of acute, acute lumbosacral radicular syndrome is favorable, with most pain complaints diminishing within two weeks. Treatment typically includes pain medication, physical therapy, and surgery in some cases. In general, the clinical course of acute sciatica is favorable. Most pain complaints diminish within two weeks. Research has shown that 60% of patients recover within three months and 70% within 12 months. It's not useful to advise bed rest to patients with acute lumbosacral radicular syndrome. Standard painkillers must be prescribed at fixed times. It is recommended to advise the patient to remain active, and muscle relaxants or traction treatments are not effective. Epidural corticosteroid injections may be considered if other forms of pain relief are inadequate. And if after approximately three weeks of conservative treatment uh, complaints do not decrease, surgical treatment may be considered. Surgical treatment focuses on removing the bulging herniated degenerative disc from the nerve canal. The effect of surgical treatment on the back problems is much less predictable. Furthermore, research shows that although back pain reduction and clinical recovery occur faster after surgical treatment, the final clinical results are not different. A cauda equina syndrome is an absolute indication for urgent surgery, and emergency surgery should also be considered in case of progressive paresis. paresis. For the surgical treatment of the disc herniation, a conventional unilateral transflaval approach is preferred. The newer endoscopic techniques are preferably only performed in a study context. Spinal canal stenosis and degenerative spondylolisthesis. Lumbar spine canal stenosis is a narrowing of the spinal canal in the lower back, typically caused by degenerative abnormalities of the lumbar spine. This narrowing can compress the nerves in the spinal cord, leading to a range of symptoms, including pain, numbness, and weakness in the legs. The symptoms typically worsen with standing or walking, and improve with sitting or bending forward. This characterized decrease in symptoms during delordosis is a key distinction from vascular intermittent claudication. Diagnosis is usually made through a combination of physical examination and radiological imaging, such as MRI. Conservative treatment options include pain medication, physical therapy, and epidural steroid injections. However, when conservative measures fail to provide relief, surgical decompression may be necessary. Usually, surgical decompression of the local stenosis only is sufficient. In some cases where the stenosis is associated with spinal deformities, such as degenerative scoliosis or degenerative spondylolisthesis, additional spinal instrumentation, vertebral repositioning and fusion will be necessary to widen the canal and stabilize the vertebrae relative to each other. Due to the aging population in Western countries, the number of surgical treatments for spinal canal stenosis is expected to increase. The long-term results of surgical treatment for lumbar spinal canal stenosis are good in 50 to 80 percent of patients. Forstier disease and DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, DISH, is a relatively common skeletal disorder characterized by calcifications and ossifications of the ligaments of the spine and peripheral entheses. Uh, tendons. It is more prevalent in men than in women and it is often associated with metabolic disorders such as obesity and diabetes. While DISH is often asymptomatic, some individuals may experience generalized pain and stiffness, particularly in the spine. 
In cervical dish, mechanical dysphagia and airway obstruction can occur. Diagnosis of dish is typically made through x-ray examination, revealing anterior ossification of the least, at least four adjacent vertebrae, resembling dripping candle wax. This ossification can lead to bony fusion of multiple vertebrae, and notably the characteristic anterior ossification of the thoracic spine is more localized on the right side compared to the left, possibly due to mechanical relationships with the heart. Unlike ankylosing spondylitis, DISH does not involve ossification of the sacroiliac joints or the intervertebral disc. In general, there is no specific treatment for symptomatic DISH patients. However, patients with DISH who experience pain following a relatively mild trauma should be evaluated for a possible vertebral fracture. Scoliotic deformities of the spine. Scoliosis is a curvature of the spine that is characterized by three-dimensional abnormality. This abnormality is often depicted in two dimensions on X-ray, and many scoliotic deformities develop in childhood. There are three main aspects to consider when evaluating scoliosis, back pain and leg pain complaints, prognosis of the deformity, and the cosmetic aspect. Patients with severe scoliosis and stiffness of the back often become functionally limited over the years due to the fatigue and the reduced lung capacity. Scoliotic abnormalities in adulthood can be classified into three groups. Idiopathic scoliosis, with an onset in childhood, de novo scoliosis, and scoliosis secondary to underlying neurological, neuromuscular pathology. Idiopathic scoliosis in adulthood. Adult idiopathic scoliosis is a condition that results from abnormal spinal development that occurred before adulthood. While the primary cause of scoliosis ceases with the end of the growth, the curvature of the spine can continue to progress during adult life. This progression is more likely in patients with larger curvatures, greater than 40 to 50 degrees cob angle, and is associated with the development of degenerative abnormalities in the spine. Despite the potential for progression, adult patients with idiopathic scoliosis can function well in society, especially those with less severe curves. However, some patients may experience intermittent back pain, fatigue, and in severe cases, reduced lung capacity. Treatment for adult idiopathic scoliosis focuses on managing symptoms and preventing progression. Lifestyle modifications such as staying in good shape, engaging in aerobic exercises, maintaining a healthy weight and avoiding smoking can be beneficial. In some cases, a supportive corset may be prescribed to help manage pain and improve posture. Surgical correction is typically only considered for patients with progressive curvature or disabling back and leg pain. The surgery involves fixation, spondylodesis, of a large part of the spine to straighten the curvature. However, it is important to note that surgery for adult idiopathic scoliosis is associated with a higher risk of complications compared to surgery for childhood scoliosis. These complications can include degenerative abnormalities at adjacent spinal levels, fractures, kyphosis, and spondylolysthesis. De novo scoliosis. De novo scoliosis is a form of scoliosis that develops in adulthood, typically after the age of 50 years, and arises from age-related abnormalities in the intervertebral discs. While the bone quality remains normal, osteoporosis can develop as a secondary complication, making it crucial to monitor patients' bone health and vitamin D levels. Most patients experience worsening back pain after the age of 50, accompanied by clinical symptoms of spinal canal stenosis and leg pain. These complaints can be particularly disabling, especially when sitting or standing. Unlike idiopathic scoliosis, which is more often affects the thoracic spine, the novo scoliosis is always located in the lumbar spine, with the apex of the curvature typically at L2, L3. Progression curves can lead to the significant disruption of the sagittal alignment, and strongly correlate with the severity of symptoms and disability. As with the treatment of idiopathic scoliosis at young age, the treatment primarily consists of lifestyle rules, limited strain on the back and suppression of symptoms with a lightly supported corset and or painkillers. As a last resort, the spondylodesis can be considered, which usually involves performing a long spondylodesis process from thoracic L5 or the pelvis <laughs> In contrast to idiopathic scoliosis, almost the entire lumbar spine must be fixed. This causes relatively many complications and problems in the medium term. 
such as degenerative abnormalities at the adjacent levels, adjacent segment degeneration, with even fractures, kyphosis, and spondylolysis. Scoliosis is secondary to underlying neuromuscular pathology. Scoliosis is frequently associated with underlying neuromuscular disorders, particularly Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis. These neurological conditions can trigger the development of scoliosis in a previously healthy spine. Patients with scoliosis secondary to neuromuscular disorders typically experience back pain, fatigue, and a reduced ability to bear weight, in addition to the primary symptoms of their underlying condition. The characteristic elongated curve of the scoliosis in neuromuscular disorders can be identified using radiological imaging. Treatment for this type of scoliosis is primarily conservative due to the inherent progression of trunk deviation caused by the underlying neuromuscular disorder. The treatment of the deformity is actually always conservative. All forms of surgery have complications and are only used in very exceptional cases because the underlying conditions causes an inherent progression of trunk deviation. The next chapter is on kyphotic deformities of the spine. The normal spine maintains a delicate balance between lordotic curves in the cervical and lumbar regions and kyphotic curve in the thoracic region. These curves work together to keep the spine in equilibrium on the pelvis in the sagittal plane. However, variation in these normal curvatures can occur, such as a decrease in the lumbar lordosis with age leading to the adaptive change in the position of the pelvis and lower extremities. Pathological processes can also disrupt the sagittal balance, with serious consequences for the patient. Local vertebral fractures that heal into a wedge shape can cause localized kyphosis, while Schuermann's kyphosis increases the kyphosis of the entire thoracic spine. Ankylosing spondylitis can cause both increased thoracic kyphosis and extended lumbar lordosis due to the ankylizing of the vertebrae. In contrast, spondylolysthesis, characterized by the forward sliding of the L5 vertebra relative to the pelvis, creates an enhanced lumbar lordosis that is compensated by the thoracic spine. When compensation with the spine itself is no longer possible, patients may tilt their pelvis or bend their knees to maintain the sagittal balance. These compensatory mechanisms can be very tiring and lead to various complaints. Understanding the mechanisms of sagittal balance and its disruption is crucial for the effective diagnosis and management of spinal disorders. Spondylolysthesis means the forward sliding of the vertebra relative to the underlying one. This anthrolysthesis actually only occurs in the lower lumbar spine, where in an upward position shearing forces cause the L4 or L5 vertebrae to slide forward relative to the underlying vertebra. It always means that a kyphotic change is occurring. In adulthood, the two most common causes are ismic spondylysis. Uh, in adulthood, the most common causes are 1. Ismic spondylolysis based on spondylolysis and 2. Degenerative spondylolysis based on disc degeneration. Spondylolysis and spondylolysis in adults. Spondylolysis is a common condition affecting 5 to 10% of the population. It's characterized by a bony defect in the connection between the vertebral body and the vertebral arch. While usually asymptomatic, it can lead to the increased mobility and accelerated degeneration between the vertebrae. The condition typically develops in younger individuals, possibly due to the repetitive forces, and genetic predisposition also plays a role. Spondylolysis most commonly occurs at the L5 level, often bilaterally. The bone defect can cause the vertebral body to slide forward relative to the arch, a condition known as spondylolysis. This forward sliding can widen the central spinal canal. Spondylolysthesis is classified into low grade, less than 50% slippage, and high grade, more than 50% slippage, based on the severity of forward displacement. Low grade spondylolysthesis is a relatively benign condition affecting the lower spine. It is characterized by mild forward slippage of the vertebral body, typically less than 50% relative to the vertebral arch. Despite the anatomical abnormality, most individuals with low-grade spondylolytic spondylolysthesis are symptomatic, are asymptomatic, and do not experience any pain or discomfort. However, some patients may develop disabling lumbar back pain and radicular leg pain. These symptoms often arise after the age of 30, when second degenerative abnormalities of the disc may also develop. In these cases, treatment is usually not necessary, 
and conservative measure, measures such as rest, pain, medication and physical therapy are often sufficient to manage symptoms. However, if symptoms persist and significantly impact quality of life, surgical stabilization spondylodesis, may be considered. This procedure involves fusing the displaced vertebra to the underlying vertebra to prevent further slippage and alleviate pain. It is important to note that decompression with stabilization is not recommended for radicular leg pain associated with low-grade spondylolytic spondylolysthesis, as this approach fails to address the underlying abnormality and may provide limited relief. Sherman skyphosis is a growth disorder characterized by an exaggerated curvature of the upper back, specifically the thoracic spine. This condition typically develops during the adolescence and is more prevalent among boys than girls. While individuals with Schoerman skyphosis may experience back pain in adulthood, it's typically not debilitating. Braces, exercise therapy and possibly medications are sometimes prescribed for growing children and adolescents. There is no indication for a corset or a brace in adults. Surgical intervention to correct the kyphosis may be considered for larger symptomatic deformities, but these operations are associated with fairly high complication risk. There is therefore no indication for surgery for cosmetic reasons. And usually the operation can be performed via posterior approach, but in some patients an anterior approach to the spine must be added to remove the intervertebral disc and increase the mobility of the spine in order to achieve the optimal correction. Ankylosing spondylitis, also known as back Tourette's disease, is a chronic inflammatory condition that primarily affects the spine and sacroiliac joints. It is an autoimmune disease, meaning that the immune system mistakenly attacks healthy tissue. This inflammation can lead to the fusion of bones in the spine, which can cause the kyphotic deformities, making the spine appear to curve forward. The exact cause of ankylosing spondylitis is unknown, but it's thought to be caused by a combination of genetic and environmental factors. The HLA-B27 gene is the most important genetic risk factor for ankylosing spondylitis. This gene is present in about 90% of people with the disease, but only 1% of people with the gene will develop ankylosing spondylitis. This suggests that there is other environmental factor that is also needed for the disease to develop. The symptoms for ankylosing spondylitis can vary from person to person, but these typically start in the early 20s. The most common symptom is low back pain, which is often worse in the morning and improves with activity. Other symptoms can include stiffness, fatigue, pain in the sacroiliac joint, and loss of flexibility in the spine. In advanced cases of ankylosing spondylitis, the spine can fuse completely, which can lead to a number of complications including kyphotic spine deformities, limited mobility, pain and psychological problems. Early diagnosis and treatments are important for managing ankylosing spondylitis and preventing complications. Treatment typically includes a combination of medication and physical therapy. The medications used to treat ankylosing spondylitis include NSAIDs, tumor necrosis factor inhibitors and physical therapy which can help to improve flexibility strength and range of motion in the spine. In severe cases of ankylosing spondylitis, surgery may be necessary to correct the kyphotic deformities or to relieve pain. And spinal fusion surgery is the most common type of surgery used to treat ankylosing spondylitis. This surgery involves fusing two or more vertebrae to, together, which can help to stabilize the spine and reduce pain. With early diagnosis and treatment, most people with ankylosing spondylitis can live active and fulfilling lives. The next chapter, abnormalities in the lumbosacral and sacrococcygeal areas. Congenital abnormalities, developmental disorders and growth disorders do not always have to lead to complaints in childhood. Sometimes these type of abnormalities only become apparent in adulthood after x-ray diagnosis has been performed, often in connection with lower back problems. The most common anatomical variations are lumbosacral junction anomalies, spina bifida occulta and coccygeodynia. These types of abnormalities, which are found during x-ray examination, often cause anxiety in patients and can therefore maintain the complaints. The question is always whether these anatomical variations can really explain patients' complaints. Lumbosacral transition vertebrae, LSTVs, are common anatomical variations of the lumbosacral spine, characterized by an abnormal connection between the lumbar vertebrae and the sacrum. These variations can involve the assimilation of the fifth lumbar vertebrae into the sacrum, sacralization, or the transformation of the first sacral vertebrae into a lumbar vertebra, lumbarization. The presence of LSTVs can lead to the numerical discrepancies in lumbar and sacral segments, potentially causing confusion about the exact number of lumbar vertebrae. 
Moreover, there is an increased risk of developing HMP or disc degeneration at the level above the lumbosacral transition vertebra. Extensive lumbosacral articulation can sometimes lead to symptomatic facet atrocis. In certain cases, additional imaging techniques such as CT, MRI and SPECT may be considered, and treatment is conservative, if necessary supported with local infiltrations. Surgical treatment of the lumbosacral transition vertebra is not indicated. Spina bifida occulta is a mild form of spina bifida. It's characterized by a hidden defect in the lower spine, often asymptomatic. This condition is frequently discovered incidentally during an x-ray examination. While many individuals with spina bifida occulta experience no symptoms, some may experience pain, a stiff back, scoliosis, or urological disorders. Long-term complications associated with spina bifida occulta include scarring, motor and sensory loss, leg deformities, spasticity, and progressive scoliosis. Coccygodynia, or tailbone pain, is often caused by extra mobility in the sacrococcygeal joint, which is similar to the intervertebral discs at higher levels of the spine. During pregnancy, this joint may become more mobile, contributing to coccygodynia. The other tail vertebrae fuse quickly, allowing for no movement between them. Four anatomical types of the coccyx have been identified, and those that are bent or kinked forward are more prone to develop coccygodynia. Interestingly, bone pain and reduced function of the pelvic floor muscles are sometimes linked. This can occur after childbirth. Pelvic floor physiotherapy can often effectively alleviate these symptoms. When experienced tailbone pain, a strong physiological component may also be involved. Surgical removal of the coccyx nerve can further weaken the pelvic floor muscles leading to post-operative complications such as incontinence. This is an additional reason to persevere with conservative therapy, even though patients may continue to experience persistent complaints despite lifestyle modifications, such as using a wind ring cushion and treatment with NSAIDs and local injections. Referred pain in the coccyx can also arise from osteoarthritis or the lower lumbar sacral intervertebral joints. The next chapter, new developments in spinal column surgery. There have been enormous developments in spine surgery in the recent decades. Not only are major surgical corrections and instrumentations possible with the modern instrument techniques, such as pedicle screws and cages, but completely new surgical, often minimally invasive, techniques have also been developed. The effectiveness of many of these techniques and methods have not been demonstrated, and prospective studies are currently ongoing. In this overview, the theoretical background, indications and further possibilities of various new techniques in spine surgery are briefly discussed. The possible place of these techniques within the current arsenal of treatment for disorders in the lumbar spine will become clear in the coming years. Vertebroplasty for osteoporotic vertebral collapse. Percutaneous vertebroplasty is a minimally invasive procedure that can alleviate pain caused by osteoporotic vertebral collapse and can stabilize and strengthen vertebra weakened by tumor growth. However, it is not without risk, as leakage of bone cement can lead to complications and increase susceptibility to fractures in adjacent vertebrae. Recent studies have also questioned its overall effectiveness, suggesting a more targeted approach for patients who have not responded sufficiently to conservative measures. Lumbar disc prosthesis, introduced in the 1990s for treating low back pain caused by intervertebral disc degeneration, aims to replace the affected segment with a metal prosthesis and a polyethylene core, mimicking the successful hip and knee prosthesis. Unlike spondylodesis, which fuses vertebrae, disc prosthesis allows for movement potentially reducing long-term degeneration at adjacent levels. While initial studies show comparable or slightly better outcomes than spondylodesis within two years, long-term concerns arise due to the risk of disc prosthesis collapse or loosening. Revision surgeries are challenging and associated with high morbidity and complications, further exacerbated by the prosthesis placement low in the lumbar region behind major vessels. Additionally, disc prosthesis are often used in younger patients, making revision surgeries more complex. The supposed advantage of reduced degeneration at adjacent levels remains unproven. Interspinal implants. Traditional surgical treatments for neurogenic intermittent claudication, such as decompression with or without stabilization, often carry significant risks and complications, especially for older patients with comorbidities. These risks include iatrogenic spondylolysthesis, postoperative infections, nerve injury, pseudoarthrosis, and material fracture. To address these concerns, interspinous implants have emerged as a promising alternative surgical approach. Interspinous implants are spacers between the spinous processes of adjacent vertebrae. Their minimally invasive nature allows for a simpler and quicker surgical procedure with reduced risks. 
The primary benefit of the interspinous implants are twofold. They limit hyperextension of the spinal column, preventing spinal canal compression, and they cause posterior distraction of the vertebral segment, increasing the diameter of the spinal canal and foraminal openings. Additionally, they may reduce pressure in the posterior part of the intervertebral disc, although this effect has only been demonstrated in experimental studies. Despite their potential advantages, the effectiveness of interspinous implants for neurogenic intermittent collocation remains uncertain. Current evidence is limited, and the more research is needed to establish their efficacy and long-term safety. And as a result, interspinous implants are not yet recommended for routine clinical use outside the scientific research setting. Minimally invasive surgical techniques, including endoscopic transforaminal surgery, have gained traction in the recent years for treating certain types of back pain. Transforaminal endoscopic spine surgery is the most prevalent minimally invasive procedure for spinal disorders, particularly in patients with symptomatic lumbar radicular syndrome and stenosis. While numerous studies have investigated the effectiveness of endoscopic transforaminal spine surgery for lumbar hernia, only one randomized controlled trial has been conducted yielding inconclusive results. Notably, there is a lack of randomized studies evaluating the efficacy of the technique for lumbar stenosis, and therefore, the effectiveness of endoscopic transforaminal spine surgery in alleviating symptoms for spinal canal stenosis remains unproven. You can show appreciation for the content by liking, subscribing or commenting on the video.